what's unfortunate is if we continue to uh, march forward uh, with this. I think, what does our survey say? A hundred, can you look on the uh, survey, what the waste, fraud, and abuse totals to? I know we've got that figure. Does anybody monitor that? So that it looks like to me it's a great political issue for the Republicans that they're not meeting, and it's a great political issue for the Democrats if they are meeting this. I say it's forty billion a year, and nobody knows, and nobody says anything about it. Well, I think a lot of it has to do with it being a little bit in limbo with the uh, with the courts and all, and not really knowing. Uh, and there's just such a high likelihood that it will unravel. If the individual mandate alone is deemed unconstitutional, uh, the whole thing unravels, and it, we will need to start start over. Uh, okay. What was the figure? Forty. I heard four hundred billion was what they were supposed to get from Medicare, out of Medicare to help pay for the affordable Obamacare. Okay. Well. Uh, and it doesn't. If, if you even if you're not even if they're going to find it unconstitutional, somebody should be getting that average of forty billion dollars a year since it's been in effect for a year and a half, and we don't know anything about it. Hmm. Yeah, I, I think that number is never going to happen. That I can get your name because uh, based on the, uh, the the group that works for the president, the Office of Management and Budget, he works for the president. The total in all of government waste, fraud, and abuse is a hundred billion. This is according to the office, the White House Office of Management Budget. So I don't know how you could get four hundred when there's only a hundred or four hundred billion out when you've only got a hundred billion uh, throughout the whole budget. Well, we'll so we'll, we'll, we'll check. How are they doing on getting it back? Uh, there's been no report uh, back to us, but I bet uh, Energy and Commerce, uh, even though the name doesn't suggest it, they have uh, oversight over that uh, committee and what they're doing in that regard. I'll, I'll follow up with their committee and see if they have gotten any report directly to their members. Come back there. Oh, yeah. You. <laughs> I'm Linda Schroeder, and I have a two-part question. Is the Republican Party going to be presenting any jobs bill in Congress? And the second part of my question is I just read that the approval rating of Congress is at 12%. Um, can you give me your impression as to why that number is so low? <laughs> well, I'm surprised it's that high. <laughs> You know, I, I think we've got a real mess. I mean, the reason I ran for Congress was I was disgusted with Republicans when they had unfettered power. I think they spent too much money. They didn't balance their budget. Uh, that was a shame. Uh, I can tell you, after serving my first term, when Democrats had unfettered power in Washington, uh, they did not know better. In fact, they took the deficits that the Republicans were running on an annual basis and made them deficits that occurred every month. So now we have a split government, and as you can imagine, uh, the American people are uh, quite polarized these days and angry. And I think you see a Congress uh, that reflects the American people. We're polarized and angry. So I think we're going to see a gridlock. We come together when we have to. For example, the last couple of weeks, uh, when something had to be done, uh, there are grown-ups that show up to get the job done. Uh, but I think this will just be reflected until the American people change. I mean, Congress is representative of the American people. Now back to jobs. See, the difference again between the parties is uh, the president seems to believe that the, uh, the Congress creates jobs, the federal government can create jobs. And I think many of us with free market roots believe uh, that the only way you create jobs is for private business men and women to do so. And so what we have done is focused on the three barriers to job creation, and that is taxation with our tax bill, regulation. We've passed many, many bills over to the Senate where they have died uh, to uh, reprioritize uh, the focus of some of these regulators that are simply off the chain. I can't go to a business these days without hearing uh, whether they're ag producers or banks 
or uh, construction companies, uh, whether it's HUD or USDA, EPA, FDIC, uh, they're putting people out of business. Uh, so we, we still need to uh, ask the Senate uh, to pick up some of those bills and correct that ill, and then of course litigation. And so a part of our, uh, our program was to do tort reform, but again the Senate is not going to agree to that. Now in addition to those three barriers, I will tell you one thing that I'm passionate about uh, because I serve on the committee and it has a huge impact to our district, to our state, and our nation, is the free trade agreements. There's three of them lingering uh, in the White House, uh, South Korea, Colombia, and Panama. They've been uh, sitting there uh, for uh, two years, three years uh, now. And uh, my belief is if we could just get those three free trade agreements, we would see an economic impact nearly immediately, especially here in the state of Kansas with our interest in air uh, manufacturing in Wichita, our ag producers, uh, every day those uh, linger on the president's desk. We are losing market share uh, to other countries that are willing to level the playing field. And this, uh, this process works just the opposite of the normal uh, legislative process. Normally Congress does its work and sends it to the president to sign on free trade agreements. The president has to send them up and then we ratify them. And so we've been asking him to do that. He has said in his last two State of the Union uh, addresses that he uh, supports them. So we're, we're asking him, begging him. We thought it was going to happen in uh, July. We thought it was going to happen in August. We're going to hope that it will happen in September. So that's something we could do. And, and everyone could agree on that uh, there's uh, lots of common ground. Yeah. Both of you. I'm Margie Wakefield. I'm a voter in the 2nd Congressional District. Um, I have a couple of questions for you. If I understood you earlier, what you said is that you aren't happy with politics and politicians is the way they are now. Is that right? Do you agree to that? <laughs> and do you also agree to me that, that you believe that what we should be looking at are the facts when we're examining the question? Is that right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I want to read from a quote from the paper to make sure I get the facts right. At your town hall in Pleasanton this Monday, you said that you have conducted polls and town halls and have concluded that your constituents, quote, do not want you to compromise. Is that correct? And I'm not probably directly quoted there, but he has the tape. If we want to go back and review it, I love you. Is it explain. true that you believe that your, your constituents don't want you to compromise? Uh, what I said, uh, let me just tell you what I said. That would probably be Actually, easier. Actually, you can you said. tell me yes or no. Do you believe your constituents want you to compromise? Uh, yeah, I don't do the gotcha stuff. What I said was that we had a group in the room that was very vocal. We had the move on folks and we had the tea party folks. And both were, you know, very irate, uh, yelling at me, uh, at times yelling at each other. So somebody in the middle stood up and said, Good golly, why don't you guys compromise, you know, on and on. I mean, I think she was saying what, uh, you know, probably middle America is feeling right now. And I said, well, because constituents tell me they don't want me to compromise. And, then I, and so that's probably where that uh, idea came from. I've got the folks from the move on who say, don't you dare give an inch, don't, don't budge. You know, that's what they're telling Nancy Pelosi and Harry Reid, if you give in, uh, you know, so help us, we'll run somebody against you. And then you've got the Tea Party folks on the right, uh, or some Republicans on the right, who again feel just as passionately uh, that if you give an inch, that you're giving up your principles somehow. And they don't like the term compromise. They don't even like the word common ground. I can appreciate both, both of those uh, polar views. And so I think, again, that is what you're seeing play out in Washington, is this, this polarization of America. And until we all change that, take a deep breath, 
relax, recognize all of the wonderful things about this country, focus on that, focus on the facts, and I believe we will move forward. Until that happens, I don't believe we can fix what's ailing us. So am I to understand that you are now saying today in Lawrence that you are willing to compromise? I have always been willing to work uh, with everyone. So you're willing people. to work with President Obama when he puts forward um, a new budget plan? Well, the problem is no one ever puts together a plan. Uh, the Congressional Budget Office a few weeks ago said out of frustration, uh, Mr. President, we can't score a speech because the Republicans are the only ones in the House that have plans in writing on paper. And so during our budget negotiations, we came to the table, the Senate won't do a budget. The President won't offer. He, he amended his budget that uh, doubled the debt in five years, tripled it in 10. When he saw that people didn't like that, he amended it through a speech. So again, we don't have anything to work with there. We don't have anything to work with out of the Senate. So you're saying the that the President thing. changed his, his well, proposals, he compromised. If, no, he, he didn't ever bring a plan, a revised plan. What we're saying is the process, this is how the process works, thanks back to government class 101. The House does something, the Senate does something, and then you meet in the middle at the conference table, and you compare your plans and you compromise. What we have seen since January 1st is the House passed a budget. The Senate did nothing. The House passed six appropriation bills. The Senate did nothing. The House passed three debt limit increases. The Senate did nothing. You know, for how long can you go along negotiating with yourself before you say, how about somebody show up? You know, from the other side. So I think that's where you're seeing frustration from our side. We're willing to work with you, but you do have to show up at the conference table. Is Let's, that fair? Um, I just wondered if what you would style or what you would term the negotiations when President Obama sat down with Speaker Boehner. Was that he never had a plan. It was never scored. You, I mean, you can't negotiate a speech. You can't negotiate ideas. In Washington, it only works, and anywhere. If you were going to negotiate a contract, would you not want to see it in writing? I would want to see it in writing. Let's get to somebody that hasn't had a chance and then come up back around to some of Yeah. I'm Bruce Johanning. I'm a retired Army officer. Uh, from one of my readings once, he said, a fact may be factual, but unless you have all the facts, you're being lied to. And some of the facts which you pointed out here, such as the bills that you have submitted, had attachments on there were so toxic that only the extreme right, right, right would even go for them. And I don't, and I say, why don't you sit there and talk? You know, because compromise is the American way. Can you give me an example? Because I guess I'm not sure what you're talking about. Uh, okay, the uh, the Congress, the amendment to the Constitution on the balanced budget. Okay. That is one. The way that was written, and I look at it, and I can't give you it off the top of my head. No, I know what you're talking I've, about now. I've got injuries and so on. <laughs> but that is just one issue there, which is just one of many. You know, they're very toxic attachments. But you're saying that you submit things, but you have so many strings attached to them that are toxic to the majority of the people, let's say on the left side of the aisle, or even those that are in the middle of the toxic. I don't understand how you can sit there and say that you submitted things, when actually, in a sense, you have submitted things that are predetermined to fail because no one wants to accept it. Even when the president looked at it, and they said, no one wants this, I will veto it. We, you know, and there's been, the president has said, let's talk about it. But I have seen people on the right and on the left pounding their fist on the desk and saying, I will not compromise. To me, what they're saying is, we're going to do it my way or no way at all. If we're going to do that, we're just going to have a dictatorship or totalitarian government. 